Thank you, and, and thank you everyone for coming out today for the summit. Um, this is, as uh, people have talked about, you've heard already uh, a little bit about the scope of human trafficking around the world. Uh, and whether one looks at the high-end numbers of uh, in the 40 millions, if one looks at the low-end numbers in the 20s, um, one has to think about the fact that each one of those people is not a statistic, that each one of those people uh, is somebody who had hopes and dreams, who still has hopes and dreams uh, that take them into uh, the lives that they deserve and the lives that we have to work to deliver for them. Um, we often talk about this being a, a hidden crime, and we juxtapose uh, the 50,000 or so victims uh, that were uh, identified by governments last year, or the uh, 10,000 or so prosecutions that happened uh, last year uh, against this notion of 27 or uh, 47 million people. Uh, and we come up with some very small fractions, uh, and we are mad, and we should be mad uh, at that difference. Uh, but we also then retreat to this idea that this is a hidden crime. If this was a hidden crime, then a hero like Lisa would not be able to walk up to it and bring us evidence of it the way that she does. If this was a hidden crime, then the men that go to the women who are offered for sale in open air brothels, on the streets, on the internet, etc., would never find the people that they are going to abuse. If this was a hidden crime, then the fish that we eat, the shrimp that we eat, the clothes that we wear, would never find themselves to us. So one of the challenges that I'm going to make today to you, and I'm going to make a number of challenges uh, over the next 20 minutes, uh, but one of the challenges that I'm going to make to all of us is to retire that concept of this being a hidden crime. This is only a hidden crime if we hide ourselves from it. This is a, only a hidden crime if we avert our gaze. I want to thank Thomson Reuters um, and uh, everyone, uh, the sponsors and, and everyone for this uh, wonderful summit, this wonderful event that will help us uh, meet the challenge that those survivors of trafficking uh, hopefully uh, laid down for you as you looked into their eyes, um, that will meet the challenge that uh, they mutely demand of us that we go out and do something. The names that we might not ever know, but the people who have already touched our lives in this way. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those people uh, today, people who've touched my life, uh, people who have made a difference in the fight against human trafficking, and people who have made a difference uh, in the world. And in doing that, um, I want to challenge all of us that these are people who have, who have made a difference. And every person has that ability to make a difference, no matter what you do. If you are a lawyer, you can certainly work, as I did for many years as a prosecutor, you could certainly work doing direct service provision to trafficking victims. You could work as an investigative judge, or you can work in uh, the uh, health and human services, or other things like that. But you can also do pro bono work. You can also volunteer with the people who are helping trafficking victims, trafficking victims who need immigration status, trafficking victims who are refugees, uh, who need to be able to stay uh, in a country, trafficking victims who need someone to be in court with them when they have to go in and confront the person who did this to them. But I'm not a lawyer, some people say. Well, I can't do anything. I'm just a graduate student, or I'm just a student. I'm just a housewife, or a dentist, or I'm a banker. What would a banker do? The reality is everything is transferable. Trafficking victims, when they come out on their journey to becoming a survivor, they need everything from a place to stay, to dental hygiene, to literacy. So the idea that people can be dentists against trafficking, the idea that people can be truckers against trafficking, the difference that people can be bankers against trafficking, should not be something that is unusual. 
Because the reality is that everyone here, and here I will quote Liam Neeson, those of you who know me know that I am not a big fan <laughs> of the movie Taken. Let me rephrase that. I love the movie Taken. I am not a big fan of it as a accurate portrayal of human trafficking. Um, and for many of us who've worked on human trafficking, uh, much of the last five years has been going around and disabusing people of the idea that human trafficking involves being kidnapped by Arab men at the airport in Paris who then try to sell you to other Arab men unless your dad is a former CIA agent. <laughs> However, Liam Neeson did say one thing correctly in that movie. But he said it on behalf of all of us when he called those bad guys and he said to them, I have a very special set of skills. Well, our very special set of skills and the, one, the very special set of skills that are in this room are not necessarily that we can do all of the things that he ensued to do over the, the next 90 minutes of that movie, but rather that idea that we can each harness what we bring to the table. And whether that is coming up with new ways uh, to harness technology, whether it's through uh, facial recognition, whether it's through blockchain uh, transaction tracing, whether it's looking at ways to bring together communication across different parts of Southeast Asia, whether it's looking at money laundering techniques, looking at reporting structures so that we can actually dismantle the illicit flow whether it's bringing it so that lawyers from different jurisdictions and different legal traditions can actually bridge those gaps through an innovative legal hub, whether it's thinking about how business can start to address. All of those are things that, frankly, only happen because each of you in the room has, to quote Liam Neeson, a very special set of skills. Now, why would we take our time to do this. There's so many things to do, uh, not only in our lives, but also in our professional lives. Um, if you're in the banking business, you know there's, there's loans to make, there's deals to make, there's underwriting. There's all sorts of words that I don't even know uh, if, in the banking business. If you're in the, the due diligence or the risk protection, uh, if, you, know, you could spend a lot of time and you could probably make a lot of money. In fact, I have a lot of friends who do doing nothing but Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, work, um, looking at not only the American uh, regulatory scheme, but other uh, companies, uh, other countries' regulatory schemes. And yet, you can also take those skills and start using them to address human trafficking. Now, the wonderful thing about the summit, and this is one of the reasons why I'd like to single out Kimberly uh, Cole and her team uh, for thanks uh, for this, is that they have put together a group of folks today for us to be able to learn from as to how we can harness our own skills, people who are doing this, people who've been doing this um, f kind of since the inception, uh, some of whom uh, you may know, some of whom you may be meeting or hearing from from the first time. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I love uh, hearing uh, folks talk about is the recognition that this is such a multifaceted issue. Um, you'll hear, and, and uh, I'm sure, uh, this idea that this is a crime of many crimes. Um, if you think of it more like uh, asset, money, uh, asset forfeiture and money laundering um, or the Racketeering and Corrupt Practices Act, um, I would typically say this is a plethora of predicates because there's so many predicate offenses um, that are involved in reducing someone to a condition of compelled service. Um, that it's almost impossible not to have something that would get you into a money laundering uh, situation. Now, when we think about money laundering, we often think about big international organized crime, the mafia, whichever mafia of your choice, whether it's the Yakuza, whether it's the Russian mafia, whether it's the LCN, the old La Cosa Nostra, uh, with the uh, Sicilian and the Italian communities. Um, but that idea of organized crime. And a lot of the people who make money off of human trafficking, that $150 billion that you hear about through the ILO's excellent um, uh, analysis of the economics of uh, forced labor and human trafficking, that $150 billion is not going 
to those shaved head Mercedes wearing um, long leather jacket uh, folks, although it's going to some of them. Um, a lot of it is going to people who you might think of as being legitimate business people. And it's because human trafficking impacts legitimate businesses. And it doesn't take very long for it to do that. It jumps very quickly from this human rights crime, from the assault, the extortion, the involuntary servitude, the rape, uh, what have you. Um, it jumps very quickly into the legitimate economy. And then once it does that, it becomes all of our problem. It's very easy for all of us to say, trafficking is something that other people do. It's not just trafficking is something that happens over there. Trafficking is someone else's problem. Somebody should do something about that over there. But also, every one of us probably looks at these situations and we say, well, those traffickers are horrible. Well, I'm very happy to see that this is uh, one of those summits where everyone is wearing clothes. Um, and therefore, everyone is wearing pieces of clothing that are held together with thread. And the chances of that thread having come from cotton that was picked by forced and child labor in Central Asia is high enough that I can say with a pretty good, uh, a pretty good guess that almost every one of us is literally touched by slavery. Every one of us owns something that someone who was enslaved was part of. Whether that's the precious minerals that make our cell phones be able to work without melting, whether it's the fish and shrimp that we eat, the cocoa that we eat, the coffee that we drink, or the clothes that we wear. And so it's not a matter of someone should do something about them. Rather, it's we should do something about us. I'm going to take you on, on a very quick journey from the last 20 years or so of this fight. If you look in the mid-1990s, there was an increasing recognition that something was wrong in the global economy. Sweatshops is what we called it. And we thought of it as in the garment industry. And one of the things that we saw was that for the first time, people were starting to look at the supply chains, where the garments were being assembled. Those garments were being assembled, in the United States at least, the places that got people's attention. Those garments were being assembled in sweatshops in Southern California. They were being assembled in sweatshops in our Pacific um, islands. And they were being assembled in sweatshops in Latin America. And so, as a result, when the resultant scandals hit, people stood up and did something about it. Auditing was put into place by some of the companies who had found themselves with this in their supply chain. Groups were formed to advocate for trafficking victims and to help trafficking victims. And I definitely have to, to embarrass uh, Lillian Chong, uh, who's one of the first uh, of those auditors, uh, who came into the, the scene right as that was happening and really pioneered uh, what people were doing out in the factories in the wake of the discovery of slavery uh, in Saipan and other parts of the United States. And I also have to embarrass Jenny Stanger, uh, who's here from Salvation Army uh, in Australia, uh, who was one of the people that founded one of the most important American NGOs, uh, the Coalition Against Slavery and Trafficking, uh, which started out on the heels of a case in which 75 uh, Thai men and women were chained, literally chained, uh, to their uh, sewing machines in a garment factory in El Monte, California. We walk in the presence of people who were on the cutting edge as this issue was first being identified. Since then, we've seen the Palermo Protocol in the United Nations that comes in with this 3P approach of prevention, protection, and prosecution. I was a prosecutor for a long time. And I prosecuted a lot of traffickers. And I was able to help liberate 
more than 600 trafficking victims. But more importantly, I was able to help negotiate the Palermo Protocol and to help write the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in the United States. And perhaps the most important thing I did as a prosecutor with policy uh, input was the idea that prosecutions are not the answer. So rather than me being a traitor to every prosecutor in the world, what I'd like to say is that this is how you prevent. This is how you make it so that the needs of the victim are put at the same level as the needs of the state. So what do I mean by that? Well, traditionally, the ideas of human trafficking had been that there had been a violation somehow of the sovereignty of the state. You'll recall that a lot of this was done before the Palermo Protocol through the old British White Slave Trafficking Act of 1880, which made it illegal to move prostitutes across international borders. Now, the rhetoric of why that was necessary was that a lot of those women were being mistreated. They were being held against their will, et cetera. But the thing that was illegal was moving them across an international border for prostitution. And that was the dominant law in almost every jurisdiction, certainly all of the common law jurisdictions, for 100, almost 150 years. It continues to be the dominant law here in Hong Kong, and hopefully we'll see a modern anti-trafficking law put in place to supplement that, so that it's not about movement, but instead looks at the underlying exploitation. Uh, it's something that we're seeing in country after country over the last 10 years, after the Palermo Protocol comes in and says, it's not just about prosecuting. It's not just about moving them around. It's about the exploitation. It's about victim protection. And it's about prevention. So where does that bring us? Once it's about prevention, it becomes a whole new ballgame as far as civil society is concerned. It becomes a concept of sustainability. Sustainability is often something that we talk about in the environmental um, side, but we don't necessarily, until recently, talk about social sustainability. But the idea that agriculture is not sustainable if the hands that pick the crops or the hands that pull the nets are enslaved, that fish or that grain or that tea is as spoiled as though someone had poured chemicals on it, spoiled by the blood and the suffering of those who we asked to harvest it for us. Talk about shifting externalities. Talk about shifting the true cost of a product to the most vulnerable people. And if we don't recognize that, we then truly are culpable. And so, in the last few years, armed with intelligence that comes out of things like the siren reports, which first were telling people what was actually happening in the seafood industry in Southeast Asia, armed with information from Oxfam, armed from information that's flowing up through the non-governmental organizations that are taking care of victims all over South and Southeast Asia, and feeding up through the victim case management system that Liberty Asia is doing. All of those are giving us a better understanding of what this threat pro profile is. And hopefully, if we look, if we are willing to look, a better understanding of what our part is. Now, we all have a part to play. And I'll, I think, spend the, the next few minutes just outlining a few challenges that face all of us going forward. And then I want to get off of that just a little bit and talk about some people. Because at the end of the day, this is not a theory. Those cases that I mentioned that I had done, the people who I was able to help uh, as they liberated themselves, are not theories. Those are people. Those are people that trusted me to be their voice. And those are the types of people who you can be a voice for as well. So what are the challenges? One of the challenges, I think, is because this is a crime of many crimes, it is also an issue of many issues, is that it is very easy, whether it's for states 
or companies or for those of us who are interested in this from whatever our pre-existing role was to exempt things out from human trafficking. One of the reasons why there's this 47 million or 20.1 million, all of these are because people end up applying these filters and that ends up filtering people out. Now, of course, the law should do that. And when you go in and you're trying to figure out was this done in violation of a law or not, you need to be doing that kind of sorting. And yet, thinking about what those filters are, whether we are setting up false dichotomies that don't truly reflect the reality of those who are enslaved. And so suddenly you can say, well, that person's not enslaved on that fishing boat. They're actually a Rohingya refugee who I'm going to classify as a terrorist because I don't like Muslim uh, refugees uh, coming down from Myanmar, if you are a governmental actor who's thinking that way. If you're Australia, you can say, well, we just don't want any refugees that happen on a boat. And even if they are subsequently enslaved, then we are going to put a line in the sand. If you are the United States, you can end up saying, well, you know, let's all agree on American girls, but let's put up impediments to girls and women from other countries who we might find in the sex industry here in the US because how we feel about illegal migration. So taking those filters and interrogating those and figuring out at the end of the day, what are we dealing with? If we're not focused on the underlying enslavement, the underlying exploitation, the underlying suffering, then shame on us for doing what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, all that does is hurt people. I mentioned earlier, is this a matter of criminal organizations or is this a matter of business and business as usual? And I want to take that even one step farther. Because as business as usual often sounds an awful lot like cultural acceptance, which sounds a lot like boys will be boys, which sounds a lot like not saying something when your friends want to go to a strip club, not saying something when people joke about going to prostitutes, not saying something when you know that people in your organization are taking people to hostess bars for business entertainment. That idea of boys will be boys needing to be thrown out to the side and making the cultural shift that does not look at girls, women, and vulnerable young men as commodities for sale. Legal changes, as I mentioned earlier, the, this idea that legal and procedural changes have to be done throughout not only state actors but also business actors. But most importantly, the kind of transparency that allows us not only to understand what's happening within someone's supply chain, but the kind of transparency that allows us to see the people within that supply chain. I'm going to tell you about two survivors of human trafficking. One of them, a woman by the name of Ima Matul. Ima taught herself to read and write English when she was a domestic servant in Los Angeles. She went and she looked at an Indonesian English dictionary and she carefully memorized and hoarded words. And over the course of six months, she wrote a note. And she threw that note over the back fence. And it was about a sentence long. And it said, help me. <laughs> Get me out of here. And then she waited, because she didn't know whether or not anybody had even found it. Another person, a young boy named Frederick, who was a domestic servant in a house in Baltimore, who taught himself how to learn to read and write at a time when reading and writing would have gotten him thrown into jail or even killed. That young man, Frederick Douglass, went on to be the first African American ambassador in the United States and went on to end slavery through his activism, his writing, and his example. Ima Matul currently sits on the President's Survivor Advisory Network, along with Holly Austin Smith and Tina Front, who you've seen pictures of today. And they were of great help for us in the Obama administration. We hope that during the Trump administration, their voices will be heard as well, as they tell 
just as Frederick Douglass did 150 years ago, the truth to the power that needs to hear and see and understand their voices. I'll leave you with his challenge from the ultimate voice of the ultimate survivor. Frederick Douglass, just before the Civil War, when people were bemoaning the fact that the country was tearing itself apart and didn't want people to stand up for freedom, said the following. Those who profess freedom and yet depreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground, who want rain without the thunder and the lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its mighty waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never has, and it never will. You have the opportunity to join us, to join Ema Matul, Tina Front, Holly Austin Smith, and you have the power to join people like Frederick Douglass and William Wilberforce and pick up this terrible sword and march with us for once and for all to end slavery. Thank you, everybody.